gospel lessons. People seem to take offense at what they think the implication of Jesus' speech might be. And I wonder if they realize first that this is Mark's interpretation of what he remembers the conversation to be like years before. I wonder too if they realize that times are different now. I doubt it because well, just 150 years ago, one of America's greatest writers, Mark Twain, put things in his book that today loudmouth people on television loudly proclaim as terrible and disgusting and its books should be burned, never realizing that Twain was no more a racist or prejudiced than anybody else in his society. This was the way the world was then. In the same way, if we can't understand 150 year culture, how can we ever go back 2,000 years and hear the word of God and say, oh yeah, I know how they're thinking. It just doesn't work that way. And the tragedy here is that as we concentrate on what we think was said, we all together miss the message underneath. So I'd like to restart this thing and just tell it with the emphasis on the message. Imagine there's a man named Jesus and he and his disciples leave the town of Capernaum and walk over to Tyre. It's quite a journey. They're out of the Jewish territory now. And as he's there, there's a lady there, and she's from, it says Syrophoenician, I'm going to say North Africa. Think about like maybe Morocco. And I'm not so sure how she got here, but say she's a tourist, and she's visiting, and her daughter gets sick. So what does she do? She asks around, Who, is there anybody here that can take care of my daughter? And they all say, well, that guy over there and that's staying with friends, I mean, he seems to be doing some incredible things. Why don't you talk to him? And she goes to Jesus. And Jesus tells her, uh, you don't understand. I, my father has sent me to his people, to the people with which he has a covenant, to the Jews, to the tribe of Israel. I'm bringing his love, his forgiveness, and the blessings of healing to them. And she says, yeah, I know, but look, at the end of the day, if you had just this much left over, maybe you could give it to my daughter, please? And Jesus sees that she really believes he has the power to heal. And he tells her, woman, your faith has shielded your daughter. Go home and she'll be okay. The commentary on this lesson <laughs> mentions the idea that in Jesus' ministry, every time there's a change in what he's doing, usually there's a woman involved. Uh, and, and most of you men here today will recognize the fact that quite often in our lives, if there's a change, there's a woman involved. <laughs> Sometimes for the better. <laughs> well, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and so what happened to this change in the lesson? Up till now, as Jesus said, he had been sent to the people of Israel, the people who God had a covenant with, to the Jews. His duty and his mission, his message and his blessings were all to people who were God's children. And now there's something else going on. The new message is God's love, his blessing, his forgiveness, everything you'd expect from God has nothing to do with your state of origin. Doesn't matter what tribe you were born into. 
It doesn't matter whether you go to temple once a year. Suddenly, it's all about faith. It's all about who you believe in. If you trust and believe in God, your faith is what saves you. Wow. We still believe that today because as Paul writes, we are saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through faith. I simply wish that a lot of the churches in this world would accept that message too. Because they're still believing that they're the ones <laughs> that are going to heaven and no one else. Thinking somehow it's their religion and not their faith or our faith that saves us. Hmm. And so we see Jesus now on a new mission. Going to a world not just of Jews but of Gentiles too that says if you believe you are saved. God loves you. He forgives your sins. He promises you not only salvation, but eternal life. Simply because you believe. Well, that was then. We still believe those words today, but, but how do they act out in our lives? Where is our faith today? How do we express that faith? Well, let, let's start with an idea. Uh, suppose you, you had a child, and the child was sick. What would you do? Well, I, I'd take him to the doctor. Yeah. Okay, and suppose that doctor says, hmm, this looks serious. Let's, I think we're going to have to admit the child. You take him to the hospital. And there the doctor and a specialist would confer, and the specialist would order some tests. And the nurses would care for the child. And technicians would perform the tests, and from there a treatment would be prescribed. Maybe a pill, maybe some other kind of therapy. And the child would get better. But where is God in all of this? Do we even think of God as we're hoping that this child will get better? Maybe in the evenings, as you're sitting in the hospital, you might find yourself beside the bed praying or, or in the chapel of the, of the hospital praying to God. But is that all? I, I've got to tell you a strange thing. I spent three months going to Toledo Hospital every day from about 10 in the morning until sometime late in the evening. And on my way to there, I would pass well, from where the chaplain parking was, which is way out and back, through the hospital, past the chapel, and on up to the eighth floor, or the seventh floor. And at lunchtime, I'd come back down past the chapel for lunch, and then back past the chapel afterwards, and then last thing at night, I'd pass the chapel and go home. And in three months, I saw one person in the chapel during the day. And when I saw her, I thought, hmm. So I went in and says, can I help you? And she turned, and it turned out to be a nun replacing the papers in the thing. And she says, no, thank you. I'm just here to, to update everything in the chapel. Well, peace be with you and with your spirit. Okay. We seem to have gotten past this business of using chapels or calling on God even at times of sickness. And that bothers me. Because ask yourself this, when you go to the family doctor or deal with the specialist, what do you think inspired them to want to cure people, to care for the sick? Hmm, wonder. And what power gave them the knowledge to learn all the skills that would allow them to do that? When you see the nurses tucking the child in, what moves them to such mercy and love and compassion for that child? When you see the technicians skillfully performing their tasks, how do you think they learned those skills? Was it a God that moved them? 
Is there a God that guides every one of us? Jesus, it says, ascended into heaven in the scriptures. And the creed tells us that he is seated at the right hand of God. But he also says, I will send the Holy Ghost to be your advocate. To stand by you, to guide you and inspire you. Was it perhaps that Holy Ghost that inspired and led all these medical people to care for that one child and also inspires you to call to God for help at the same time. But we really shouldn't stop there. I'd have to ask, what about the rest of you? When you hear that your child is sick, what do you do? Do you pray for that child? Do you call the parents and say, what's going on? Are you okay? Uh, I know with the, the Sanchez family, I had a call that says, thank you so much for all the people that have called and sent cards and even food during this time. So yes, there are people out there doing this. But what about all the rest of us? What do we do? Perhaps the answer becomes, well, yeah, I'll pray for it. In fact, um, Marsha's really good at this. Uh, she'll put her name in the bulletin and we'll pray for her on Sunday. But what about today? Well, I'm awfully busy today. I've got so many things to do. Hmm. Luther has an interesting thing to say about that. He says, where you spend your time and your money, there is your God. Ooh. So how much time and effort and money do you spend on things other than caring for your neighbor, praying to God, asking for his guidance? James, in part of his lessons, talks about being not just hearers of the word, not just coming here today and sitting back and listening to the lessons and sleeping through the sermon, but doers also. Are you a hearer and a doer? Does that reflect in the way that you spend your time and your money? This week as we discussed the sermon in our usual Wednesday luncheon debate, Annie mentioned the fact that, well, I don't spend any money at all, really. So what does that make me? And I promptly said, obviously, a godless woman. Uh, Oh, that's sore. Then she says, so where do you spend your time and money? And I said, well, on you, of course. And peace was restored in the family. <laughs> but today, I think maybe I should ask each of you, where do you spend your time and your money? This week, in fact, it might be interesting to take an inventory of all the things that you do. The times that you spend enjoying and using God's gifts. And then compare that to the times you spend in prayer and in worship and in doing things for others. And then truthfully ask yourself, where do I spend my time and my money? Because that truly says, how do you worship your God? As a last thought, this morning coming to church, I noticed a whole bunch of cars towing boats. And it occurred to me, why are they taking their boats to church? <laughs> Is there a blessings of the boats that goes on this time of year? I was relieved to see that most of you hadn't brought your boats, so it must be some other church. But you might also ask yourself, where do they spend their time and their money? Think about that this week. What do you do that shows the world by your actions and your love that you too are people of faith, that you too are Christians? 
and do that in Jesus name I pray amen we continue with the message hymn 